So we've looked at the squamous epithelium, but we're going to take it up in this video one jump higher. Let's see if we can get that pencil to work. I actually want a nice red on that. So we're going to take it from there up, right, in, so in height. It's, an, it's a step up. It's a, it's a cuboidal epithelium. And um, it's uh, not often seen in stratification. You'll see them in the sweat glands. They form two layers. And I'll get a, a, a pick for us. We can go and explore that. Um, it's a lovely epithelium. It's basically a square. And you couldn't get anything more symmetrical, in my opinion, in the living form, in a mammalian structure construct. Um, like epithelium, it rests on a basement, like all epithelium, it rests on a basement membrane. And then you've got your connective tissue underneath. Okay. And what's great about this nucleus is it sits in the middle and it's perfectly round. You're going to hear my daughter practicing the violin in the background. And um, epithelium, you know, it's a functional it has a functional uh, orientation. You know, squamous epithelium is protective in function. That's about it. So you find it in the buccal mucosa where you're chomping all day long. Some of us do. And uh, we chomp on food and sweets and all sorts of objects get mashed around in the mouth, right? And that epithelium is geared towards protection. It can come off and regenerate, come off and regenerate. And um, cuboidal epithelium... Its function is interesting because it kind of sets itself up into a glandular epithelium and uh, it m very much has a physiological function in that the apical surface can be adapted into having these unique, and we'll talk about them as we go along, unique extensions. They can have little, um, uh, is it microvilli or cilia? And... Um, it's a cilia are found in the respiratory tract, okay? So these would be microvilli. In the renal system, they're found in the collecting tubules, um, the proximal collecting ducts, and the distal collecting ducts. And they have a unique function in that they facilitate the movement, um, the transport, the transfer of ions like sodium and potassium, and we call them electrolytes, don't we? Once it's passed through the glomerulus into Bowman's capsule, very important functions there. So this is more physiological, that's more mechanical in function, if that makes any sense. So let's have a look at the cuboidal epithelium in the body. So there's quite a bit to unpack here. And the first thing I have to say as a histology techniques lecturer um, is with regards to the section thickness. And maybe you can see it um, if I look at this section here. Let's see if we can circle it. And you'll see it, the artifact here again. These uh, anucleate, almost like shells to the to the cells. They don't have any nuclei, but it's almost as if the section was cut very thick. Here you see it again. Um, when we cut sections, we want it to be paper thin, thinner than paper, two, three, four micron thick, so that we don't have this almost 3D effect, as if you're looking into the tubule, coming in, you know, coming into the tubule. Um, another comment that um, I'd like to make, and perhaps you can see it, is that the stain that's been used here is a is giving cellular and cytoplasmic um, structural content. It's telling us about the cell nucleus. It's telling us about the cell cytoplasm. Let me show you under high mag. We're seeing a nucleus. And we're seeing the perimeter of the cell. There is, however, a loss in information when we think about a hematoxylin eosin stain. Um, it has a blue purple. Um, information that it gives to your nucleus. It stains the nucleus blue-purple and it stains the cytoplasm a more orange to red color than this. I have a feeling this might be a picrocerious red stain and not really bad. I'm actually quite impressed for a 
monochromatic stain that still is capable of giving us the morphological detail I need for for this particular session because what I want to show you is a um, cuboidal epithelial cell one layer resting on a basement membrane you know if I can achieve that then I will be happy so let's get rid of my um, artifacts and let's show you this cell so I think you've spotted it by now let's go and show you the graphic there it is there's a cuboidal cell now in real life we're never going to find a square we'll get close we get close let's go out a bit and you can do you know and when we're still babies like this we're just starting out with histology we don't want to rush things you know we we can take our time in satisfying that desire to you know find, to match the theory with the practice it can be an overwhelming experience for a lot of students uh, to f plow through theory every every week and never actually um, have a light bulb go off for them and so you know if you want to take your time and find that square you're welcome to I kind of see a square I'm just going to use pencil and the problem with this cell is that its nucleus is a little eccentric it's placed here to the exterior and and our theory is kind of saying, no, 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 we need to have a cell with a nucleus that's centrally located. Maybe you can. You know, you've got to believe in yourself. You have to have confidence when you do histology that you can see these things. They, there's this um, barrier that people have, that folk have, students have to histology because, I don't know, they experience it as vast and perhaps abstract and and so you know immediately there's a wall that comes up I can't do this and I can't see it I suggest to just take small steps and identify things uh, as you go along and not to become overwhelmed and once you see you know um, something to you know reward yourself it is a it is a red tick but you know what I mean okay let's show you something else so these are all simple columnar epithelial cells this is an organ in the larger context we've gone really close up what organ well we said the kidney it's the collecting ducts of the kidney and um, running concurrently with these collecting ducts are the nephrons and something called the loop of Henle. I don't know if you've heard of this so if we just go like L H loop of Henle. Now, I'm not saying this is the loop of Henle, right? I just used it just as a canvas there, a white patch. What I am in fact saying is that the loop of Henle. I think that I'm gonna I'm gonna stand corrected. I'll come back to you. Just wait a minute. So, you know, um, the uh, loop of Henle has a descending branch and it has duct sorry it loops down it's a loop and then it ascends descending and ascending and it has a thick component and a very thin uh, duct now the the thin duct in the loop of Henle um, I'm going to take this away because I don't want to lose you has a very because of what I'm going to show you now has a very is lined by a flattened squamous epithelium so this is great to do now because um, and we're going to end it here because we've looked at a flattened squamous epithelial cell and we've looked at simple squamous epithelium but we haven't shown you an example we've showed stratified squamous so here we go let's see if you can find it so um, there are in fact two examples in this image which makes it a wonderful slide um, that's turned out to be quite rich in uh, the information that we're looking for so we can redo loop of Henle we can do it here I'm going to draw an arrow into its lumen and just go LOH and you've got your pens and papers and your pads next to you so you're just writing this down with me okay LOH loop of Henle and then I want you to say that the descending limb and ascending limb 
but the narrow ones, right? The thin branches are lined with a flattened squamous. Okay, look at that. And try and outline the basement membrane of this loom of Henley. I wish you could actually make it thinner. I think it runs off screen and comes up there. That's in my best estimation. And then it runs off screen. And then what I'll do is I'll mark the the squamous cells that I see. So just make a special note and rewatch the video. Um, I'll make little yellow markings. There, there's a squamous cell. Can you see it? And there's a squamous cell. And there's a squamous cell. Um, there's a little bit of an artifact and overlap. So I won't commit to it. But do you see the little bump? Now if we look at the visual, I don't have it here now, over here. If you look at this drawing, you see that? And then we quickly go and look at this one. This is in life. This is in a kidney of a human being. And so I'm trying to set up a light bulb for you. Bing! Because I couldn't find, in my opinion, there isn't a more similar sketch to Oh, I'm not even in the frame. <laughs> Hang on. We have to do here, I know. We have to do this. <laughs> Hang on, guys. I'm 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 new to this, okay? Be patient, please. In life, in diagram. I couldn't find a more accurate reflection of the two, right? Simple squamous, simple squamous. So in a test or a multiple choice question coming up. Name an example of a location of a um Simple squamous epithelium. Where do we find it? And it's in the loop of Henley, the descending limb, the thin limbs descending or um, ascending, but in the thin limbs, see on the other side, for columnar epithelium.